paid guys next to me when I'm pissing. This video will probably be quite long because it has to do with the subject of free will. That is, does the fact that the universe is run and organized by cause and effect, and therefore human behavior is predetermined, or if humans have free will or not? There's two sides to this subject regarding what is meant by free will and what is not meant by free will. Uh, free will is generally described as the ability to choose otherwise. I know, it's a huge uh, bowl to be putting uh, philosophical issues into. The other um, side of what people consider free will is human choices. If a person stops at the side of the road and helps somebody, did they have a choice to do that or not? Was it predetermined or not? And what are the social consequences if a person did not have free will and it was all just cause and effect that tumbled down through billions of years of cause and effect? And if there's any social issues involved if free will does not exist, such as, you know, crime and um, negative consequences associated with those crimes. So I'm going to go through a video by Daniel Dennett. Um, his subject is neuroscience and how it shows that the second type of uh, free will, that is, that applies to humans and human choices and humans' behavior, is not determined by the, the part of the brain that is called us, or me, or I, or myself, not us. Erase that us. So this is what I call the executive functioning of a human brain. And that's just a small part of the human brain. And I look like Bozo. The rest of the brain does all of the decisions and all it handles all of the physiological um, goings on in the body and it accumulates uh, knowledge and experience and it stores that that um, stuff around the brain the, um, it is highly organized but it, there's also the mushy bits where um, like memory um, memories are rebuilt they're not actually stored as such, but recovered, and then the brain fills in what's missing, for example. So, um, I have a link down to this uh, video description uh, regarding one paper that Daniel Dennett is addressing. It is um, Libet et al., published in 1983. The title is Type. Uh, excuse me, time of conscious intention to act in relation to onset of cerebral activities, uh, what they call a readiness potential, the unconscious initiation of a freely voluntary act. That is the title of the paper. And the um, DOI is down here, so if you want to read that, um, people interested in free will and neuroscience, I encourage them, encourage them to do so. So, we shall move on to Daniel Dennett's video. Let me trot out one of my recent uh, favorites, which I devised to uh, jangle the nerves of neuroscientists who've been going around saying that neuroscience shows that we don't have free will. I think their reasons for saying that are ill-considered, and moreover, that what they're doing is apt to be mischievous and doing some real harm. I can perhaps agree with him on that regarding social norms and if people come to understand that, yes, there is no such thing as free will, that might modify their behavior. 
However, what science discovers does not have anything to do with what people do with those discoveries. It is not pernicious to state that humans appear to have no free will. Science has been saying that for at least four decades. Particle physics, in a, for ex a, one good example, there's no room for free will in the universe because there's no mechanism that can provide free will. So I concocted a little thought experiment, a little intuition pump, to suggest that. So this is the, the case of the nefarious neurosurgeon who treats a patient who has obsessive compulsive disorder by inserting a little microchip in his brain which controls the OCD, the obsessive compulsive disorder. Now there is such a chip. Actually, they are coils that are applied to a person's head with a helmet, but we'll ignore that incorrect statement. Uh, uh, it's been developed in, in the Netherlands, and it works really quite well. That's science fact, but now here comes science fiction. So the neurosurgeon, after she's operated on the guy, sewed him all up. So, okay, your, your OCD is under control now. You'll be happy to learn. Uh, but moreover, our, our team here will be monitoring you 24-7, and we're going to be controlling everything you do from now on. This is where his idiotic analogy crashes and burns. Having no free will because cause and effect has determined our behavior billions of years ago does not equate to some person modifying another person's behavior through a chip on their heads, let alone monitoring. It doesn't make any sense to make that analogy. Uh, you'll think you have free will, you're think, you'll think you're making your own decisions, but really you won't have free will at all. Free will is an illusion that we will maintain while controlling you. Goodbye, have a nice life. Sends him out the door. It is my assumption that people do see the flaw in this analogy. Well, he believes her. She had a shiny lab and, you know, lots of degrees and diplomas and all that. So, what does he do? Well, he, thinking he doesn't have free will anymore, he gets a little self-indulgent, a little bit aggressive, he, a little negligent in how he decides what to do. And pretty soon, you know, by, by indulging some of his worst features, He's got himself in trouble with the law. Non sequitur. It does not follow that when people learn that they do not have free will, they will suddenly stop behaving the way that they usually do. It makes no sense. Dr. Dennett cannot produce any evidence showing that that has happened, let alone projecting current data to show that it will happen. No sense at all. Human behavior is mostly hardwired. We are social animals. Well, you people are, I'm not. And we behave like social animals. We do not, uh, on a general trend, run off and slaughter each other. Well, okay, in the United States, yes. But we don't automatically, you know, oh, I don't have free will, therefore I am going to rob this bank. It is an idiotic analogy, and it is false. And he's arrested, and he's put on trial. And at the trial, he says, but your honor, I don't have free will. I'm under the control of the team at the neurosurgery clinic. I say, what's this? And they call the uh, neurosurgeon to the stand. I said, did you tell this man that you were controlling his every move? He didn't have free will? And she says, yeah, I did, yeah. But I was just messing with his head. That was just a joke. I didn't think he'd believe me. Even if this could or will happen, the person who committed the crime is still guilty. We know that mentally ill people who commit crimes and it is highly suspected or confirmed that they have done so because they are mentally ill, they are still guilty. 
It is the punishment phase where extenuating circumstances are applied. Now right there, I think we can stop, take a deep breath and say, that Daniel Dennett is an idiot. Well, she did something really bad. That was, that was really, she really harmed that man. In fact, her little joke telling him that actually accomplished non-surgically pretty much what she claimed to accomplish, accomplish surgically. She disabled him. By telling him he didn't have free will, she pretty much turned his free will off. Note that Daniel Dennett is assuming without evidence that free will exists and that humans can apply it. I know of no evidence that even remotely suggests that free will exists other than the illusion that we have it. And turned him into a morally uh, incompetent person. Now, if we agree that she did a bad thing, if nobody recommends people play jokes like this, what are we to say about the neuroscientists who are telling the public every day, we've shown in our neuroscience labs that nobody has free will? Non sequitur and irrelevant. As I pointed out, scientists discover things. They publish their discovery. It says nothing about what people are going to do with that knowledge. People, as I also pointed out, don't just suddenly change their behavior just because a few scientists have discovered, and I will discuss this further, that humans do not have free will and their behavior has been predetermined. Uh, specifically, he's referring to neuroscience, and like I said, I will address that later. I think if the neuroscientists recognize that what my imaginary neurosurgeon did was irresponsible, they should think ser seriously about whether it's irresponsible of them to make these claims about free will. Okay, where do we draw the line regarding human discovery and human knowledge? Should we have stopped it uh, after fire was discovered because fire burns people and does terrible things to forests and whatnot? And le learning how to bang the rocks together or, or rub sticks together to create a fire. Was that a terrible discovery? Should people not have learned that? Or the people who did learn it, should they not have propagated that knowledge to other people? It's the same with free will. If the universe dictates that free will does not exist, and we discover that, should we just pretend that that knowledge wasn't collected, pretend that we don't know that, don't publish in science journals that discovery. Once again, Daniel Dennett is assuming that free will exists. Therefore, he is assuming that if people learn that it doesn't exist, or are told that it doesn't exist, they will have negative consequences for social interaction and society as a whole. Not demonstrated. And it's not just a fantasy. Vos and Schooler, in an important paper which has been replicated in several different ways, set up an experiment really to test this with uh, college students who were given two texts to read. One was a text, they were both from Francis Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, and one was uh, um, not about free will, and the other was about free will, and basically it said, free will is an illusion, um, uh, all your decisions are actually uh, determined by causes that, that uh, uh, neuroscience is investigating. You don't have free will, that's just an illusion. Yes, and I will once again reiterate that if that changes their behavior, that's on them. It's not on the scientists. All right, so there we have two groups, the group that read that passage and the group that read another passage from that book 
of the same length. After they've read the passage, they are given a puzzle to solve where they can earn some money by solving it. And the experimenters cleverly made the puzzle slightly defective, so there was a way of cheating on the puzzle uh, that was, oops, inadvertently revealed to uh, the subjects. And guess what? The subjects who'd read the passage where Crick says free will is an illusion cheated at a much higher rate than the other ones. In other words, just reading that passage did have the effect of making them uh, less concerned about the implications of their actions. And, uh, just and then what happened after that that Daniel Dunn did not mention? In a follow-up study, quote, by the way, links are down below in the description, quote, here we show that although people are intuitively cooperative, challenging their belief in free will corrupts this behavior, leading to impulsive selfishness. Note the word, note the word impulsive. But again, if given time to think, however, people are able to override the initial inclination towards self-interest induced by discouraging a belief in free will. End of quote. It does not last, apparently. People revert back to their moral and ethical standards after being told the fact that free will does not exist. Um, Daniel Dennett is therefore full of shit, basically, to put it mildly. Do not put too fine a word on it. Uh, never mind. They, they became, as it were, negligent, or worse, in their own decision making. Briefly. I think that's a, a, an important and sobering thought. And now for the neuroscience involved in the reason why Daniel Dennett is apparently upset that neuroscientists have concluded that human agency and their intentions are different and show there is no free will in, involved in human behavior. The first link of this description will lead to a chapter one of a book on the subject. The title of the book is called What Science Tells Us About Free Will. Basically, studies have been performed and duplicated that when a human brain makes a decision, it makes the decision without executive functioning being involved. That is, the brain comes to a conclusion or decision or choice of action, and then it tells the part of the brain that is equated with me, I, myself. The, 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 time that it takes for the brain to make a conclusion and then tell it to the executive functioning is very slight, but it is measurable. It suggests that a person only makes the decision and the course of action and their behavior after the other side of the brain decided that for them, basically. Um, this appears to be the case. It means that the human agency is not in charge and that the other part of their brain is. So neurologically speaking, free will does not exist. And that is the one side that I mentioned regarding free will. The other side is the, the physics involved, the knowledge that cause and effect cannot be violated, therefore free will does not exist. Because this video is all about me, of course, I wanted to share my experience regarding that time delay between brain making decisions and then telling me what decisions they have made and then I have the illusion that I made those decisions and not the unconscious brain part that actually made the decisions. 
I have a atypical brain. I think I've mentioned a few times that I am autistic, and I think differently than an a than a neurotypical person does. Therefore, I do not know if my experience is common among the human population, but I will describe it. When I am relaxed and laying down and I'm comfortable and I meditate on the thoughts that I'm having, the language-induced thoughts, the inner dialogue as it is called, which for me, of course, is in English, and other people will be in their primary language. And these thoughts uh, come spontaneously to, to people with no conscious involvement. But when I meditate and I turn off the inner dialogue, which is not easy, by the way, I can see my brain making decisions for me and forming th thoughts for me. And I don't have any participation in that. I can see hundreds of associations and logic uh, trees going on in my brain every second. And this is underlying that inner dialogue. And to, to stop that inner dialogue, it is not easy to do and then it is not easy to maintain because it is very much um, having a language thought and suppressing it is very much like trying to suppress the need to breathe. Like if you're underwater and you know that you need to breathe and you hold it in and you try to to quash that need to breathe. It's the same thing with inner dialogue. When one does that, as I mentioned, the neurological workings of the brain can be observed. It is not in any language. It is not a non-language. It is hard to describe as um, associations being formed and I say observed instead of hear or see because I make the observation without participation as it were. If, a, if I notice that some of those associations are telling me that I need to do an inner dialogue, I quash that. And like I said, hundreds of times a second these associations and these logic keys are being applied and I do not suggest that people try this but if they do they will see their inner dialogue being quashed and seeing what is actually behind their thoughts and my brain tries to inform my executive functioning uh, part of the brain and I quash the executive functioning part. Um, this is easy because I have issues with executive functioning because I'm autistic. And if people out there have experienced the same thing, have observed the neurological activity that informs them what uh, informs their executive functioning, what they have decided on, I'd like to hear about them, people, because as far as I know, um, either this is not common or people don't discuss it. To reiterate, the neurology involved strongly suggests that people do not make their own decisions. Their brain does, if that makes any sense. Because there's many different parts of the human brain and other brains. So, Daniel Dennett is an idiot. 